Visiting the region of Fontaine, there's a lot to notice in its glorious aqueducts, mechanical robots, and cute, talking, weird little creatures called melazines. There are flying ships, floating cubes of water, underwater prison, enormous courts, magic shows, and this guy right here. These things I've mentioned are so far unlike what we've ever seen before, and it is what makes the nation of Fontaine unique, compared to the previous ones. At first glance, you would think that this place would be an ideal location to visit, or even a place to call a permanent home. However, you would be shocked with the secrets this nation has to offer, and be terrified of its fate. Fate, a word used numerous times in the story of Genshin Impact, a story riddled with the meddling of the past, discovering inner tragedies, and interpreting different views have been the driving purpose of our main character, the Traveler. As we enter this region, we are quickly introduced to the prophecy regarding Fontaine, raising a lot of questions and theories. It piques the interest of the players, yet requires a ton of hours to finally know the truth. So, in this video, I'll try to summarize the whole story of Fontaine's Arkan Quest in just a few minutes. The story starts with us, the Traveler, and Paimon heading towards the road to Fontaine. Along the way, we bump into Deya and Caravan Reba, who offers to lend us some mercenaries as a company. However, we decline her offer and decide to continue the journey alone. Near the borders of Sumeru and Fontaine, we arrive at one coastal elevator named the Romaritim Harbor. It is here where ships and visitors are given passage as they head further into the region. There are more coastal elevators such as this one that are scattered in Fontaine's borders, but we only know of two so far, this and the Lumidos Harbor. However, because their names are taken from local specialties within Fontaine, we could guess that the names of those other unknown coastal elevators are Lake Light Harbor, Rainbow Harbor, or Lumitoil Harbor. So the reason for these coastal elevators is because Fontaine as a region has an unusual geography. Its base landmass is elevated, which requires a special mode of transportation to gain a means of entry, thus the reason for the coastal elevators. As we arrive at the harbor, we are surprised by the technology that this new nation has compared to the previous ones. Still, we shifted focus to the main task at hand and asked two locals about the whereabouts of the Hydro Arcan. These two, named Irena and Etienne, share about a previous trial done at the Court of Fontaine, which we learn is the capital of the nation. Here, criminals and the accused get the chance to defend themselves while a mass audience watches. At this point, we are still unclear of the ways happening within a trial, which is why Rena further explains that a judge named Nervalet serves as the moderator of the trials, while a special type of machinery called the Oroctrice Mechanique de Nalise Cardinal gives the final decision on whether those accused are guilty or not. That name is quite too long to repeat, so I'll just name it the Oroctrice. Furthermore, the two advise us to head to the court of Fontaine, where the Hydrowarkin lives, but informs us that meeting her would be very difficult due to the long list of people who have wanted to meet her face to face. As we end the conversation, we soon notice a lonely girl standing at the edge of the harbor as if she plans to do something indescribable, so we decided to check on her. From that point, we meet the two sibling twins, Lenny and Lynette, who both share some details regarding a prophecy predicting Fontaine's destruction and its future. However, before we get to know more about it, Linny and Lynette invite us with them to the Opera House, where they will soon host a grand magic show. Before we begin strolling around, we are suddenly stopped by people dressed in unique blue suits which indicate Fontaine's guard, called the Masson Guardianage. Moreover, a particular lady dressed in the same color also arrives, which appears to be none other than the Hydrowarkin herself, named Farina. It seems that a Fontanian spy overheard our plans to come to Fontaine during our conversation with Dea at Caravan Riba and informed Lady Farina at this news. Standing atop the harbor, Farina greets us and welcomes us to our nation. This might seem wholesome, but as we are introduced, the people in the harbor believe that we have come to Fontaine for an entertaining show. For this reason, Farina declares that a duel should take place. Unclear of what this duel is, we sheathe our sword only to be faced by Clorand, one of Fontaine's champion duelists. These champion duelists are Fontaine's best fighters, and their jobs are to fight any criminals or accused who wish to defend their rights via a duel. If they win, they are given freedom, but if they lose, they are killed on the spot. Fontaine's justice system is flawed and complicated, but will be further explained as we head towards the next acts. As the escalation continues, Farina explains that the duel she refers to is a trial case between her and us, the Traveler and begins to accuse us of a law that forbids any person who has entered Fontaine to release an unauthorized flying object during the first three days of a month. 
This refers to none other than our emergency food, Paimon. However, just in luck, Lenny foresaw this to happen and revealed an invisible string he tied between us and Paimon. This then invalidates Farina's accusation and drops the charges. Farina and her company leave, but note that this won't be the last time we will see her. Relieved, we continue heading to the Opera House, but Lenny noted that he had some materials to collect for his magic pockets first, so we decide to head to their home in the Court of Fontaine. By means of the Aquabus, we start heading towards the capital. Charlotte seemed to have conveniently joined us on the trip and shared a story about the missing disappearances of women all throughout the city. This gives a sense of tension across the city and hints at the premise of this first act. Finally, arriving at the Court of Fontaine, we are introduced to the city's merchants, City Spots, and Fremenay, who is supposedly the adoptive sibling of both Linny and Lynette. To explain further, Linny and Lynette were once abandoned children who were adopted into the orphanage called the House of the Hearth. At the time they were adopted, it was managed by a Fatui harbinger named Arlequina. Inside the orphanage was an already adopted child named Fremenay. As years passed, the three grew close with one another and treated each other as family, and called Arlequino their father, who seemed to also give certain tasks and missions from time to time. Back to the story, as we further meet with Fremini, we decide to help him deliver materials to Estil, the boss of Fontaine's workshop. As we stop by, Estil explained the concept of Indemidium, the energy used to power most of Fontaine's technologies such as its lights, devices, transportation systems, and the mechanical robots called Clockwork Mecha. In contrast to the other nations, Indemidium is an energy source that is unique to Fontaine because it is extracted from people's belief in justice by the Oryk Trees. In other words, the Oryk Trees not only gives the final verdict in trials, but also acts as the main power generator of the city. As we continue discussing about Indemidium, a group of locals belonging to the Confriery of Cabriere arrives and demands payment from Estil, but is soon interrupted by one of the Fatui Harbinger's child. After a series of street brawls with a group of locals, Child is surprised to run into us in Fontaine again for the 100th time. As we ask what his purpose was in coming to Fontaine, Child shares about his growing temper and says it has something to do with his vision. He also shares his life experiences when he first fell to an unknown place and met a swordmaster named Skirk. To give some context, Child was 14 when he met this Skirk and soon mentored him in combat skills, which got him to where he is now. In his time in that place, he also saw a massive whale that would haunt him from time to time. Child soon ends the conversation and says that he has some matters to attend to, including a personal face-off with Clorand, who claimed to be Fontaine's best champion duelist, since Child seems to have a love for catching brawls with Tevat's best fighters. But before he leaves, he gives us his hydrovision, believing that we should take hold of it as it could affect his temper and get in the way of his duel. Leaving us to attend to our personal duties, we decide to roam around the Court of Fontaine. After a day's worth of exploring Fontaine, we headed on to the Opera House of the Island of Arenaeus, where Lynette was waiting for us. Here we are introduced to the Fountain of Lucene, a place said to be where all waters converge, and if we look in here closely, we hear the cries of a mysterious lady calling out a name called Vache. Additionally, we can also hear another lady crying, which will be revealed later in the story. As we enter the Opera House, we are given seats at the front row, but surprisingly, we are placed near the Chief Justice, Nervalet himself. Following a series of conversations, Linny and Lynette's magic show soon begins. Throughout the magic show, we watch as Linny and Lynette perform their magical tricks. As a final trick to end the show, Linny calls for an audience member named Halsey to join the stage and acts as the instrument of his performance, but shortly after, an incident happens which marks the true start of Fontaine's story. In this incident, one of Linny's assistants, Cowell, dies when a suspended water tank falls onto him and an investigation is suddenly in effect. Farina, who was witnessing the show from her private seat, accuses Linny as the main suspect and declares that a trial will be set to determine his fate. Nervalette acknowledges Farina's charges and sets us to act as Linny's attorney. To take a full view of the incident, we decided to conduct investigations, and it is here we meet Navia, president of the Spina de Rasula, an organization aimed to help the locals of Fontaine and situated in the Flub Sandra and the village of Lausanne, their main bases. It is important to note that this organization was an important sponsor in Fontaine's economy, as they were the ones who helped in the construction of the Aquabus, which led to it being named after Clementine and Callus, Navia's parents. This is why the Aquabus lines are named Clementine Line and Callus Line as a commemoration of their contribution. 
Navia, who is now the current leader, is accompanied by her two bodyguards, Smellis and Silver, dressed in black suit coats. Navia and her bodyguards arrange a formal dinner with us and agree to help in defending Lenny's case as they see this trial related to the case of the serial disappearances mentioned earlier by Charlotte and the Aquabus. With help from Navia and following a series of questions with key witnesses, we wait for the next day for the trial to finally begin. As the next day arrives, Nervalet calls to start the trial as the two parties prepare their statements. In the first statement, Farina reveals to the whole audience that Linny and Lynette are part of the Fatui organization linked to the House of the Hearth, which was no ordinary orphanage, but a station for raising orphans to become members of the Fatui. Given that the Fatui are already in a bad light within Tevat, this puts Linny's case closer to the losing side. Because we weren't informed of this information, we asked for a pause of the trial and consulted with Linny behind the stage. From that point, we began to lose trust in Linny and Lynette, but they both explained that they were ordered by their father, Ardekino, to discover the hidden secrets of the Orctrice, how it operates, and how it manages to judge people as if it had its own consciousness. Using the magic show as a ruse, Linny snuck behind the stage during the performance and was set to go inside the Orctrice. However, he was shocked to hear a female voice within and decided to withdraw from their plan. We continue to agree to help the twins as we believe that justice should be served correctly, and knowing that Linny was really innocent regarding Cowell's death, it's important that we see this through to the end. Given that the truth was still unrevealed at this point, it was later noted that Linny didn't expect the turn of events regarding Cowell's death and the disappearance of the audience member Halsey. Throughout the trial, we continue to defend Linny's innocence and with the help of Navia, we finally learn the whole truth. It appears that Cowell was carrying tubes of water from the Primordial Sea and was part of an organization selling an illegal drug named Synth. This Primordial Sea is an unknown place that seems to dissolve Fontanians when they come in contact with it and is the birthplace of many Hydro lifeforms. Cowell was related to the missing disappearances case and planned to kidnap Halsey, who we later learned was not a Fontanian local but a person from Monsat whose true name was Lillian. Lillian and Cowell were the true suspects, and this in turn cements Linny's innocence, giving us a win at the trial and with Farina. But before we begin to celebrate, Nervalet and Farina begin to suspect the guard who checked Cowell's belongings. However, as soon as the guard confesses his true nature, he is dissolved into the water, leaving everyone speechless. It was declared that another investigation be conducted, but nevertheless, Linny walked out of the court as not guilty. As we exit the court, Lenny and Lynette confront us to apologize and explain that Arlequino ordered them to do this plan as a way of preventing Fontaine's prophecy. Lenny further emphasizes that Arlequino herself is from Fontaine and wants to help in preventing the destruction of her nation by any means possible. We accept their apology but remain resentful of the twins. 